What's up, everybody? This is Raul Avila with Father's Voice, along with my co-host, Pastor Nate Conan. Let's go. Uh, this is Father's Voice, a podcast dedicated to empowering men to embody essential qualities and values in the roles of father, husband, provider, and a man of God. In each of these episodes, we will chase greatness, drawing inspiration from timeless wisdom of the Bible and personal experience from many of our guests. And uh, we're confident you're going to love this and share this. So let's get the ball rolling. Let's Pastor go. Nate, who do, you got, who so do we got today? Today we have a Coachella Valley legend. Nice. And so um, our guest today, honestly, is a phenomenal uh, man of God, inspirational leader, a pioneer um, here in the Coachella Valley, none other than Pastor and Dr. Jeff Walker. So I'll give a little bit of an introduction to him. Um, anybody that knows the Coachella Valley probably knows who he is. Um, he founded and, le and led and is still leading um, Victory Christian Center, was in Rancho Mirage and currently now is in Palm Desert. Correct. And I think it's been over 40 years? 42. Oh, my Lord. In February was 42 years, yeah. And so it's not yeah. often that pastors pastor very long. And, I mean, in general. I mean, you might go to some places where you see guys going for a long time, but I think Pastor Jeff Walker has been pastoring probably one of the longest in terms of, like, um, I guess, Protestant churches here in the Valley, which is, to me, legendary because Coachella Valley, um, with all its beauty and the wonderful things that it is, is also a challenging area to minister in. Yeah, it's, it's the I, truth. I would agree with that. So. <laughs> The spiritual dynamic here that uh, is unseen, really, but uh, has an impact on on real life ministry day to day. Yeah. Certainly, I had seen one young guy come from like Ohio, and he came out here to plant a church. I think it was Baptist or something. Anyway, he he, had t he started, and I told him, "Hey, man, it's a tough." I said, "It's a very all over the place dynamic out here." And he said, "Oh no, I I, I did great out in Ohio. It's going to be fantastic here." And I was like, "Okay," and and unfortunately, <laughs> it didn't. It, it probably after about three or four months, and he had the, a big backing to help him, but he ended up having to, you know, leave because spiritually there it's an it's a it's a place almost like no other. Right. I remember when I first came here, I talked mm. to some other ministers, and they'd say like, "You have no idea what you're coming into," and I'm like, "Ah, what?" And Even it's, for you coming from San Bernardino, absolutely. Mm. And and San Bernardino has all its, its challenges as well, mm. but but the I think the highs and the lows of what the Coachella Valley presents in terms of the spiritual overtones, like it's it's an unreal kind of place. Mm. I, I'm sure that there's other places similar, but it's it's just it's unique and challenging. Yeah, I would say I don't know because I've never lived there, or been there. But I've been there actually, but not lived there. Uh, but Las Vegas, I would think that would be have similar, some unique spiritual dynamics. Yeah. Uh, to to do a work for God there too for yeah. sure, yeah. and when you take the the Coachella Valley and like cut it into half and say east west, um, just speaking candidly, currently the more fertile ground is in the eastern half of the valley, and so the western side. So when I, when I say that, I'm just like sort of saying from Rancho Mirage over to Palm Springs is by far the most challenging, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying it's bad soil; it's just challenging soil. Mm -hmm. It's it's really. Um, in terms of having vibrant, growing, thriving works is very, very, very mm -hmm. challenging. Right. Yeah. And a lot of good churches in Palm Springs over the years. Uh, Rodney Dean was there in Palm Springs for many years. Of course, he's in heaven now, but, um, you know, he ended up uh, leaving the ministry. And uh, it's just, yeah, it's, it's challenging. challenges there. I know that uh, Pastor Fred at Desert Chapel is doing a good job. And there's he certainly is. Going there, so, mm -hmm. yeah. But but nonetheless, it's it's challenging. Like I most agree. of your bigger, stronger churches are on the eastern side, not on the western. Yeah. The western yeah. side. That's yeah. just what it is. Yeah, I agree. Not, not to put anybody or anything down. That's just sort of what it is. Because yeah. there's different soil types, and then in different areas, there's also those spiritual overtones. So... Um, Pastor Jeff Walker has been pastoring now 42 years, which to me is legendary. To and, and here in the Coachella Valley, uh -huh. yeah. Pastor Jeff? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Started in Cathedral City. I felt a call to come here. I'd never been to Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. And that's a long story, which we won't go into. But um, felt a call, showed up, didn't know anyone, not one person. And um, a businessman from my hometown, I found out, owned a home here. And so I called him before I drove out in my little beat-up Toyota. Um, drove out from where? From Illinois. Illinois. Yeah, it's the cornfields of Illinois. I'm from not Chicago. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm from. Uh, and uh, he, so he owned a home here. So I told him I was coming here to start a church. He was a believer. And so he said, well, you can live in my home for free. If, if he was building two houses, uh, speculation homes. 
He said, if you'll just walk through these every day, you can live in my house for free. So that was great. I lived there many months. Uh, a friend of mine from Los Angeles that I'd gone to Bible school with, Bible college, I told him I was living in this beautiful home. He should come see it. So he came out and uh, he said, I know one person in this valley. Her name is Connie Diaz. Connie's now in heaven. But she had a tiny little home that she had bought from the priest at St. Louis Catholic Church. So she lived right across the street from that church. A really small home. And uh, so Joe called her, my friend called her and said, would you fix us lunch? So she uh, fixed this chicken mole. And she said, why are you coming here? And I said, well, I feel like I'm called by God to come and start a church. And she said, well, where are you starting? And I said, I have no idea. I just got here. And she said, well, we're starting in my living room. So the first day I got here, I had a place to live. The first week I got here, I had a place to preach. And it's just gone from there. And wow. uh, so it's, it's been a very joyous, miraculous journey. Been a lot of fun. I bet it has been. So and you're still a pastor? Yeah. Currently. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you do you pastor more like a bishop or or you have a church that I have you a pastor? church. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've helped plant many churches. Um and that's been a really one of the big joys. I've loved pastoring and loving people and walking with people through their joys and sorrows of life. Um that's very fulfilling. Um, but planting churches and having sons in the Lord and daughters in the Lord, um, that's a great joy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm supposing that since they see, would see me as a bishop, but I don't, I don't have anyone call me that. Um, I prefer Archbishop. <laughs> <laughs> Why? No, the I'm Pope, just it's, a it's, it's a joke. Higher, higher yeah, it's a higher. It's a higher. It's a cardinal or whatever. No, I, I just, uh, but, but functionally, <laughs> yeah. uh, I suppose I would serve as a bishop to them. Oh, uh, okay. to these, uh, well, not all of them are younger than me, but um, they still call me dad. You know? That's cool. That's awesome. And then as well, so you also have a, a PhD in therapy or it's psychology? Clinical psychology, clinical psych- yeah, PsyD, uh-huh. a doctor in clinical psychology. So I'm a practicing psychologist. That's I kept going to school while I was pastoring. Uh, in 1990, we... 85, we bought land on Bob Hope mm-hmm. there. And in 90, we built that building and finished it. And I was walking through the building. And, and there was I, probably nothing there back then, right? Nothing, nothing. out there whatsoever. I mean, it was just stunning. That was so de- uh, desolate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I thought, Lord, I, you know, I thought this was going to be a bigger sense of victory than it. I was grateful for the building mm-hmm. and thankful for the building. And proud of our work, the congregation board and everyone that was involved. But it's really ultimately about people, not about the building. Not that I thought yeah. it was about the building, but I, mm-hmm. there was it, it wasn't as fulfilling as I thought it might be. So I decided I want to pour myself into honing my skills to help people. The building only serves the people. And uh, so I went back to school and uh, just to sharpen my skills, mm-hmm. and I just kept going and going until finally one day they, I had a theological track and then the psychological track of study, and they gave me a piece of paper at, after a lot of classes, and they said, here, you can be a psychologist now. So I prepared <laughs> for the state board examination and, and passed it, thankfully, uh, miraculously, yeah. <laughs> the first time. And... Uh, I've been practice in practice uh, almost 20 years now. Wow. Yeah. And uh, that's been fun because I did my doctoral internship at Betty Ford, so a lot of things you learn there. Mm-hmm. And then I worked three years at County Mental Health treating chronically, severely mentally ill homeless people. Wow. And I never in my world, wildest dreams thought I would fall in love with crazy homeless people, but I did. Wow. And love serving that community and... Um, it was a blast. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, one of the challenges. So obviously, I'm in ministry as well. A lot of times, people. In fact, I talked about it briefly this past Sunday. A lot of people expect all pastors to be good at counseling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what I've told them is, I'm just not good at counseling, mm-hmm. nor am I schooled in counseling. Right. And so, although that adds another degree of specialty in terms of ministry, um, 
not all pastors should spend a lot of time counseling because sometimes I've seen them do more damage than good. I believe that can happen. Yeah. yeah. Of course, the word and sowing the word into people's life is always a safe endeavor. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but if yeah, and if there's not a grace to do it, it's it's kind of a frustrating thing for yeah. pastors anyway. And better to find someone that really has a call to do that. Yeah, and a and a compassion for it. There you go. You know, I want, want to jump right into your, um, I guess, childhood or early development. So you came from Illinois. I did. You did. Um, talk to us briefly about your childhood. Good, bad, highs and lows. Speaking of sort of even preteen kind of experiences, especially with your family. <clears throat> okay. So I know this is about a lot of focus on fatherhood, mm-hmm. uh, uh, this this um, program, this um, podcast. So early early in my early childhood, uh, my dad was an alcoholic, and uh, he wasn't a fun alcoholic. He didn't drink every day. He was a, kind of more of a binge drinker, but he was mean and a little bit um, rough with my mom. Mm-hmm. And so I have, <clears throat> I have a younger sister, so I became her protector. <clears throat> so when, pardon me, <clears throat> so when my uh, dad, uh, I was when I was about nine years old, my dad got sober in AA, and um, it changed the dynamic of our family so much. Um, and so I would encourage, if I could just take a moment, encourage anyone out there who's listening. If you have a, a drinking problem or drug problem or any addictive behavior, that you work on that, and because it can, it's not too late, mm-hmm. you know, and and you can make such a difference for your loved ones uh, and friends and children and spouse, wh- whomever. Um, so my dad uh, had over fifty years of sobriety when he when he went to heaven, wow. and uh, yeah, so it was was good. And so, about what age did he transition from being? So it would have been I, I was about ten. So let's see, my my dad would have been thirty. Probably. Okay, so around ten years old for you, your dad yeah, nine or 10, left nine alcohol or and sort yeah. of came clean of that. Yeah, he AA. Got, yeah, went to AA. So then, when you when you so all your life you knew him as an alcoholic up to the age of ten years old. Yeah. he was he was an alcoholic. Yeah, and, yeah, and we we had the full blown dysfunction. You know, my mom mm-hmm. would say things like. Now, kids, be quiet, be quiet, and don't don't make too much noise because otherwise you'll make your dad nervous, which is a euphemism for he'll go drink. And so when you're three or four years old and you think if you're just good enough, daddy wow. won't drink, that's a, that's a heck of a, a thing to put on a young child. And in addition to that, I was my sister's protector. And um, You're yeah, the oldest? So, yeah, there's two of us, uh, and oh. she's two and a half years younger. Oh. So, um, yeah, and and uh, the there's some kind of physical aggressiveness uh, toward my mother, and that was terrorizing, and I feel the anxiety of that, you know, as a little boy. And so... Um, how, how are you able to forgive, right? So you're 10 years old. You're barely mature enough to, like, process all of what's going on in life. Like, how do you forgive a guy... You're ten, you've, for 10 years, you've watched, I mean, you know, you, you, you've been programmed into all this abuse, all this wrong behavior. Was that a process of time to get? No, actually, it was not. It seemed to seem, because again, my dad didn't drink every day. It was occasional, but but it was significant when he did. Um, but but in between those uh, drinking episodes, he was a good man, a loving good man. Yeah. And once he got sober, gosh, it was just, um, I have nothing but beautiful memories after my dad was sober uh nothing but good memories um so did you have were you spiritual like as far as your having a relationship with god did that help you f- with your forgiveness of your father or was that before or? i think it was important yeah okay. and and so we even though when my dad was drinking occasionally he would go to church my mom would take us to church my dad would occasionally he'd been raised in church okay and um, um what kind of church a pretty strict pentecostal church there you yeah go. And, um, yeah, ultra conservative, you know, like if, if, uh, if you're in the movie theater and the Lord returns, I don't care if you're seeing Lassie, <laughs> you'll go to hell. It's... <laughs> no. And then he believed that. And yeah. so a lot of his, so sex, uh, dancing is worse than sex because dancing leads to sex type of Pentecostal church. <laughs> it's exactly why they never made love in a phone booth <laughs> because someone might drive by and think they were dancing. So, 
<laughs> Got it. <laughs> Pretty strict. Yeah. Yeah. No makeup. No jewelry. No. You know that kind of stuff. So yeah. Basically, earning your way to heaven kind exactly, of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Be, be good. You're not level. saved by him. You're saved right. by what you do. Right. Yeah. Very. Yeah. It's very dangerous. Extremely toxic. Yeah. When you think you're saved by your works, you're always working. You, you're never walking it's never in grace. Enough. It's, and never, it's never enough. How never could you enough. be saved by what you do? Never enough. No. Anyway, so I to answer your question, Nate, I, I think I, you know, I love the Lord and um, and that just seemed like we grew in the Lord as a family, not only individually, but as a family. And my dad, you know, uh, he was faithful to AA for a long time and sponsored lots of guys and but eventually Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. displaced his need for AA and uh, he would still help people, but he didn't need to go to mm -hmm. meetings and that kind of thing. So um, the Lord is good, you know, I, yeah. So, yeah. so, so overall your relationship with the father after the age 10 significantly improved, you were able to forgive and move on. Oh yeah. 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 And enjoy my dad. And he was a fireman. My mom was a nurse, and so I, when I got a driver's license, I used to drive up to the fire station, play cards with my dad, and hang out with him, and uh, we'd fish together. You know, so it was a good childhood after sobriety. And you said you were raised in Chicago, Illinois, so no, not a small. I'm, I'm from not Chicago. Not Chicago. I'm not from. No, I'm from the cornfields of down. So the south, rural south areas. Of, yeah, 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 that's the real. So world. sort of a country upbringing. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, a, kind of a farm. 20,000 people in our little town, but it was surrounded by farm towns of six, 800, you know, 1,200 people. And they would, all those farmers would come to my hometown, Mattoon, Illinois, to buy their tractor or their car because we had, you know, implement dealerships and car dealerships and that kind of groceries. But uh, wow. it was, it was uh, Future Farmers of America was a big part of my high school, you know. Exciting. Yeah, yeah it was fun. It was fun. Awesome. Good people. I bet they are. So, uh, so part of, uh, of, of growing up as a, you know, having that experience with your dad, how did that influence, how did that influence your parenting? Like what, what did you pick up from your father that you catch yourself doing right now that not, not right now, but raising your kids, you know, when, when they were, how many kids do you have by the Three. way? Three. So raising your kids, how did, how did your uh, childhood influence the way you raised your kids and 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 not not, not just in the in the good because you mentioned yeah. how you enjoyed your dad after yeah. he was sober but also in the in the parts in the in the times that he wasn't sober and and you caught yourself oh man I can't believe I'm doing that mm -hmm. I'm I'm doing it to my kids and my dad did it to me and you right. caught yourself repeating right the the negative but also the positive how did what are some of the things that that you would say that you caught from your dad okay Raul, are are you also a psychologist? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. That's a great I'm a, answer. I'm a practical psychologist. Yeah, you are. <laughs> no, that so because absolutely, what is modeled for us mm -hmm. becomes our normal mm -hmm. and our good. our guiding light, so to speak. And um, so, I as a father, going back to the story of. Uh, be quiet, be quiet, because otherwise your dad will drink or you'll That's make good. your dad nervous, mm -hmm. was the, what, how she would say it. Led me to believe that I had a lot more control uh, and needed to control. Uh, that became a, a sort of the lens through which I saw myself mm -hmm. and the world and people that I loved. Uh, it... it it was a big factor. And so when I was a young man, I was very angry a lot. Here are a couple of things. I don't want to take too long, but in that family, dysfunctional family dynamic, usually different roles develop in a, in a alcoholic home or a dysfunctional home like that. Family hero, family rebel, lost mm -hmm. child, family comedian, you know, the mascot. Different roles get kind of absorbed. No one assigns them necessarily, but they get absorbed by the people in the home, the codependent um, who's trying to prop up everything. So I became the family hero, and my sense of why I was counted in the world and in life was because I'm wonderful, you know. Mm. And 
And so that leads to some pretty dysfunctional behaving because that, that's your core belief mm-hmm. that I, I count and how I matter is by controlling and being, you know, that, that's how I'm going to have significance. Um, so I was pretty hard on my, on my then wife and my three children. And uh, they got, because publicly as a minister, I had an image to maintain. So I was really into image management, but I had to let this aggravation and anger out somewhere and, and living on this pedestal because I'm the family hero living on that pedestal. There's not much room on a pedestal and it's, it creates anger for, for, I'll just say to, for men here who I'm hope, hope are listening. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're living on that pedestal of, of performance and of image management, uh, it's okay to come down and stand on the ground with the rest of us because, um, it's a safer place to be. It's, it's less tenuous because um, mm. you can topple off that pedestal pretty quickly. And you it, probably and, will. <laughs> yeah, eventually, mm. somewhere, in some way. And maybe the public doesn't know it, but somebody, somebody mm-hmm. will see it. So I had some big adjustments uh, to make, and, and that was quite a journey. Um, I was very important when I was younger. I, I, <laughs> I knew a lot and almost everything. And uh, I was always in a hurry for some reason. I don't know. I don't know why. Now, when I think about it, um, and and a little, just kind of an edge of anger and impatience. And so, to answer your question, Raul, Raul um, it, it deeply affected my fathering style uh, in a negative way. But the Lord helped me, and good professionals helped me. I did went to an intensive outpatient clinic eventually. So you did therapy, even though you're a psychologist. Well, yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't a psychologist yet. Okay. Yeah, I kind of started my education, um, but hadn't wasn't a licensed psychologist. But there's I, been a lot of stigma. I'll just say, mm-hmm. as far as mental health, especially in the church, especially when it's like spirit filled people. <clears throat> and to me, it's very good that I think, in, in the, to me, in the last I don't know decade or so, there's been a lifting of that where it's. It's not a negative thing for a good Christian person to go have therapy or go to counseling because I think probably most people would benefit from it, but there was a whole lot of stigma, especially in my opinion from the 80s, 90s, and even going back from there. Stigma as in don't, don't do, it. do it. It's wrong. Like God should fix you. If you, you shouldn't be doing this. Like it was a period as like it, it was just a negative thing to do. Like you shouldn't be going and seeing these people. And so the way I've always looked at it is some people have chemical imbalances in their brain or like there's things beyond your control, just like being sick just yeah. being i don't if you're diabetic or if you're, you're going to have these things and you need to have professional help in that area mm-hmm. but there's always been a lot of stigma because god can heal you you need to think right and and that can be true and god can heal you of course but then you know like paul said i had the thorn in the flesh or god can also allow you to, to have to navigate that with help as well and so mm-hmm. i think the stigma of even as pastor jeff is saying him even having counsel and therapy. I think it's healthy. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a great verse, First Thessalonians 5.23 says, Paul's praying, he said, I pray God will sanctify you wholly, W-H, completely, entirely mm-hmm. holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, your whole spirit and soul and body. And the word spirit in the Greek is pneuma, which is spirit, mm-hmm. um, the eternal part of us that's born right. again. And then... Uh, soul is suke uh, which is our psyche Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. uh, body is soma so the the physical part and so if we don't take care of our soul and you have to really define soul Mm because people 10 souls were saved and we use that word kind of for multi-purpose uh uses um but our 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 soul and, and that's where i was spiritually I was alive. I loved the Lord. I knew the verses, but my soul had been scarred, hmm. and and certain things would trigger those wounds, mm-hmm. um, and that's why I needed when went got perhaps pro- professional help. So, like like you said, uh, Pastor Nate, I there was an element of discomfort because coming from a faith strong faith. Bible faith community, mm-hmm. um, 
you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. But there was just some stuff in me that wasn't matching up to that verse. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I love the Word and I love the Lord and I, I'm a person of faith and I believe God, like you said, can heal. I needed, in addition to the power of the Word in my life, some good anointed mm -hmm. counsel and. Uh, that's what I found at the clinic I went to. It's a very faith-friendly place. You don't want to go to just to any therapist True. because some of them are about half crazy. But um, <laughs> oh, most of them, maybe. No, well, they're, they're I think just, there's some really good ones. <laughs> a lot of a lot of therapists see a faith expression as a problem rather than I see it as part of a great support system and very healthy thing to be involved in a in a faith community or to be going to church or to have a trust in God, you know, um, that's healthy and helpful. Uh, some therapists think it's, it's, um, it's dysfunctional, hindrance. right? Oh, yeah, hindrance. exactly. Exactly. A hindrance to good mental health. Yeah. So those are the ones you don't, and if you're going to see a, a professional, just ask them, where are you on? Yeah. Uh, if I'm a, a believer and, you know, can describe that, describe that to them, um, could you do the, your best work with someone like mm -hmm. me? Yeah. So, at what age um, did you become a father? How old were you when you? I was say, eighty-eight. I was uh, twenty-nine. So you okay? You were really young. Yeah, twenty-nine. I got married. I was twenty-five. I pastored single for th about three years. I came here when I was twenty-two. Whew. Can you imagine that? And soon after, I turned twenty-three. So basically, the church. I was 23 pastoring the church and got married when I was 25. And then our first child was 20, I was 29. Did you meet your wife out here? I met her originally at the Bible college that I went to okay. in, in Oklahoma. And, and that was then, ORU at the time or was it something and, else? No, it was a Rama Bible Training Center. Okay. Then I later went to ORU to seminary. And uh, she was from Southern California. And so I was at a meeting in Anaheim. And there she was, and she had been engaged to a, a friend of mine, actually. And I said, well, where's, his name was Pat. I said, where's Pat? And she said, well, we decided to go separate ways. And so we reconnected and ended up getting married. Beautiful. And then you had one daughter, two younger sons, correct? Right, correct. Yep. Daughter, boy, girl, or girl, boy, boy. And um, yeah, they're a joy. And then my daughter has three, and my uh son who's the older son has three and my youngest son doesn't have kids hmm. so would you mind sharing um what are those struggles that that how how was like the uh if if it's not too personal what are some of the things that you would do that you would catch yourself doing mm -hmm. that your dad did and and then how did you fix that like what what are some of the things that that you did to fix that like for like let's say there's a listener that maybe like me for example I struggle with anger even still, but, but when I was in my twenties, I was like the Hulk, you know, and, and I was easily <laughs> triggered, but then in my thirties and then late forties, now I'm more like the, like the, like the Hulk that does, hasn't changed into the Hulk for five years or something <laughs> like that, you know? So learn how to control it. But so, so, so then I would catch myself yelling at my daughters, like, like I yell, like my dad used to yell at me. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute, what am I doing? I hate it when my dad did that to me. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you went through raising your kids and, and what are some practical things that maybe a listener could hear and say, oh, I could do that, you know, to switch, yeah. to change? Are you a psychologist also? <laughs> um, you should host is. a podcast or something. Too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, so I'm going to tell you a very painful story that was one of the greatest gifts my kids ever gave me. Like I said, I was, I was uh, always in a hurry, and and because people weren't in enough of a hurry, I would get angry. Mm. Uh, and now, if I was being leisurely, that was okay because it was me. But if other people, you know, it was very uh, just control, you know, kind of a yeah. theme so my daughter was the oldest and uh, i don't know where my wife was but there's this the four of us and so my daughter was helping she was always a good helper and little mom to the younger brothers so we're getting in my car and hurry hurry what's ta what's taking so long hurry 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 and, and there was no hurry 
but I was in a hurry. And so she was about 11 years old. And she got the boys in the back. And then she got in the front seat. And just as sincere as she could be, she said, Dad, are we a hassle? Mm. Mm. Are we a hassle? And I said, no, you're the greatest gift, you know, God could give me. But it was such a painful moment. Yeah. And it was a real good wake-up call. I had, I had one of those wake-up calls from each of my three kids, actually. I could tell you the different stories. One also from my, my wife at that time. She, we were driving the car, and she said, you know, I don't like to ride with you in the car. I said, what are you talking about? Because I'm a good driver. I said, what are you talking about? And she said, you just, there, there's an air of anger always with you. I don't enjoy it. I'd rather just drive myself. I don't like to ride with you. And that was a moment. So I had, yeah. with each of my kids and with my, with my wife at the time, um, moments. So the practical piece for me was to uh, really come to grips with the fact that people experienced me different than how I thought I was coming across. Mm -hmm. and, and that's hard for controlling people to embrace. Mm -hmm. that, that if you ask someone, how, you know, how do I, come, an employee, let's say, or spouse or kids, how, how, do, how do you experience me? And they might have mm -hmm. something very different to say than what we hope they would say. Mm -hmm. So that's first, is to be open to... Criticism or feedback. Feedback, yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not necessarily even criticism, but it could be criticism mm -hmm. and, and uh, justified criticism. But even feedback. Uh, and the reason why is because the only way we're going to control ourselves or calm ourselves or manage ourselves mm -hmm. is through self-awareness. Self-awareness leads to self-management or self-care, mm -hmm. self-control. Self yeah, fruit of the spirit, self-control. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's first is we have to practice self-awareness. I call that developing your inner observer. So several times a day, uh, every time you go get a drink of water, every time you use the bathroom, kind of check in on yourself and say, well, how am I doing? What am, am I Am I grateful? Am I angry? What am I anxious? What what's going on yeah. with me? And kind of check in self awareness. Then, when when things don't happen the way we the new way we want them to, let's say we still have an anger episode, uh, that you process that anger episode. Okay, what was going on? Why did I get mad? Why did I, I didn't want to raise my voice? I don't want to. Raise, I choose not to be a person who raises my voice, but I did what was going on with me and then figure out a way to do it better next time or mm. to be, improve on e each each failure can become a golden nugget because we can glean from it uh, insight mm -hmm. and so so and I'll conclude with this okay. uh, this, uh, this finding ways to um, um, slow the process down so that we're we're not just re reactionary uh, I'll, I'll say, so in, in my practice, I, I help people understand that all of us, all of us have emotional, psychological sunburn. And when that gets poked or when it feels like someone's coming toward us and they're going to poke our yeah. sunburn, that's a visceral, almost, almost uncontrollable, but it is controllable, almost uncontrollable mm -hmm. reaction to that. And it just spills out. And so if we can practice self-awareness, then we can practice self-regulation, self-calming, self-soothing. Um, and so I, I, I'm a, a completely different human being after my journey, and, and especially after the intensive outpatient program that I attended. It, it saved my life, really. Um, can you explain what that is? What, what is what is I've ne I've never heard of that Ex in intensive outpatient. Okay, so program. so you have inpatient programs like yeah. it, like if you go to Betty Ford, you're inpatient. You you stay there. You sleep okay. there. It's like in a rehab. Inpatient. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is outpatient. So it was a every day for 
13 hours a day of therapy. Oh, wow. But it was outpatient, so I stayed at a hotel around the corner. So and it's intensive in that it was not like one session a week, you know, where you go see mm. a therapist. It was an intensive oh, wow. program, mm -hmm. a week at a time, 13 hours a day. How many weeks Group, did you do that? Well, we don't need to talk about everything. Wow. <laughs> Five weeks. <laughs> Five wow, weeks. that's most, intense. Most, that's pe high level. most people go to that clinic one or two weeks. But I, I just, it was so cleansing for me. I, but was it was it like your choice or was it recommended uh, no, it was by choice. somebody? Okay. No, it was my choice. Yeah, I, I crashed and burned um, and created a horrible situation and fallout for my wife and for the church and for myself and for my kids and for the community. Um, and so I just knew I needed help. Because a full immersion. A full yeah, immersion type yeah, of yeah. I thought mm -hmm. a week at a time, seeing someone every one an hour for every, every a week, that's not what I needed. And uh, for some people, that's perfect. It works for them. Most of my clients are that. I see them weekly, um, sometimes every other week. But I needed, uh, uh, I needed a, to be overhauled. Mm -hmm. I needed an engine rebuild. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> wow. Thanks for sharing. That's amazing. Of course. So um, I, I would love to like dig deeper in that. Ask on. Um, when, when did you realize that you needed or, okay, so when you, when you went to the, to the, to the location where they do that, yeah. that, that Intensive, type of therapy yeah. Yeah. Um, and you told them, you know, I, I feel like I need more than just what, it, it has to be more than just what the average or regular person gets. Right. What did they say? How did they start asking you questions? Because maybe there's somebody listening that needs something mm -hmm. intense like maybe that. before they crash and burn or you, you know. Yeah, hopefully, please, please. Yeah. I, I always tell people, you know, the prodigal son made his way to the pig pen and came to himself in the pig pen. So I'll just say, if you're on your way to the pig pen, turn around now, uh, yeah. please, and get help that you need. Don't don't end up in the pig pen. Uh, that's not what we're designed for by our loving Heavenly Father. So to answer your question, they sent me, I, I contacted them. I'd heard about this place. So I contacted them and they said, okay, we want you to come right away. And then I'm, I started him hawing around a little bit. Well, maybe next week or two weeks. No, you get, need to get here. Um, so they were pretty assertive with me in a healthy way. And they had me fill out, they sent me, or emailed me, whatever it was back then. I don't know if we had email back in the old days. Um, but they sent me a questionnaire. So what are the issues? And uh, had me fill out several pages and, and mail that to them. So they were ready uh, when I got there. And, and the program worked. So in the, early in the morning, we had a group. Uh, and then we'd do individual therapy, individual therapy, individual therapy. Then at lunchtime, we'd have a group individual therapy and so i saw you know five or six different therapists and what they would do at that clinic is they would write notes and then if uh, let's say if if nate was my first counselor and we spent an hour together he would take notes and then if you're my next counselor uh raul he would pass those on to you so he, you knew what we had been talking about now you might have a different style of counseling you might mm -hmm. have a different you know, uh, 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 approach, you know, even diff different, um, yeah, just different counseling orientation, but you just go with your skills and start working on what we'd been working. And it, and it so it's it really powerful because sitting with one therapist for five or six hours is gets the air gets a little stale, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to pass it on to the next man or woman, and then the groups, and then you had other voices, and so it was just a really a cleansing uh, season, uh, five weeks for me. W one of the weeks uh, that we took all the kids. One of the weeks it was my wife and I, and maybe two weeks she was with me, and then two weeks just working on me only. So it was a pretty comprehensive program, and. Um, the the end goal of it was to because you said fallout with my wife and my kids the end goal obviously was 
was it headed in the wrong direction like man this this is going to be a divorce this this is going to be really really bad and the and and your goal was i don't want to lose my family right that was my goal yeah and, so and so it was to the the goal was to heal our family primarily me because i was the main damaged i had the most damage i suppose um and my wonderful gracious wife uh stayed with me after that for five years but even after all that work i had done a lot of damage in in her heart uh unfaithfulness and um sure she was just is a precious godly woman and she sure didn't deserve what i offered up you know mm -hmm. um and so we went separate ways we're still maintain our friendship my current wife and my former wife know one another and are gracious with one another and kind that's They're, beautiful yeah yeah so i'm grateful for both of them that they uh, how they process this can i just share one scripture um psalms 32 5 this, this the psalmist david dealing with his struggles he says then i acknowledge my sin to you and i did not cover my iniquity he says i will confess my transgression to the lord and you forgave me the guilt of my sin that verse to me, Psalm 32, 5, is sort of David wrestling with yep. his his whatever. But the reality of what David says is there's three different words that we would always say, like, oh, that's just sin. Like, if you say sin, iniquity, transgression, they seem to be the same word, and yet they're not. And what David is dealing with here is he's talking about this idea of being willing to uncover his iniquity. And I believe a lot of times with their, like, if you find yourself, it's, it's the story of, I don't know, a woman who's a, a, a prostitute or, or doing something on, on the extreme side of things. And you look at that person and go, wow, that's horrible. But oftentimes there's a, there's a, a deeper root that you don't see. Mm -hmm. And that's usually the iniquity. The iniquity is something unseen, but oftentimes what it is, it's almost like an imbalance in a person's lives. And they're trying to bring balance back because there's an imbalance. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we see the sin, we see the transgression or the lifestyle, but we don't see the iniquity. It's mm -hmm. like a tree with roots and fruit. Yeah. Three different things being said there. And so really, I think what therapy is in psychology is the willingness that David says, I'm willing to uncover ni iniquity, go below the surface, get into sight, like get in with somebody and go deep and, and allow like to uncover. So it's, it's yeah. the person, whenever you find yourself doing aberrant behavior, it's important to uncover the iniquity. Right. Live in the light. A absolutely. Yeah. And then when you do, truly the Holy Spirit gives you power to overcome it. So the, the Holy Spirit is the one that is going to give you power to overcome it, but you have to put in the work to uncover the iniquity. Yes. And so when David says that, he says, I'm not going to hide it. I'm going to uncover it. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, when they struggle with um, bad behavior and like, why am I doing this? I remember for my wife, my wife's a better mom than I am a dad. And I, one of the things I, I caught myself doing is she would ask me all the time, like, hey, have you given the kids their prescriptions, all their medicine? I tell her, yeah. And in the back of my head, I'm like, I haven't given him anything. Like I was just off ha having fun with the kids. I wasn't doing some of the things I was supposed to do. And I'm realizing, I'm like, wait, hold on a second. I'm sinning. And I'm sinning because there's in some ways like this imbalance between she's, she, I, I just, I realized she's a better mom than I am a dad. I'm not holding up my end of the deal. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting, I'm finding myself lying to her to sort of bring back balance in that situation. And I think it's important that we realize, you know what? It's better if I'm just honest with myself and with her. And I've told her, I said, I struggle sometimes if you're a better mom than I am a dad. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I'd rather party with the kids and take them to McDonald's and have fun sure. and not do the things I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> and so rather than catching myself lying, I got to be honest with myself and her mm -hmm. and allow my, like the Holy Spirit to help me become a better dad in that area where I'm actually taking care of some responsibilities. But I would say this, any dad that's out there, any man that's out there parenting, et cetera, you're going to have iniquity. And iniquity sometimes goes into the childhood. Like it can go right, pretty yeah, far back. Right. And it's those things you're always trying like to hide. Like if I look at Donald Trump, who I think was a entertaining and actually decent president. But sometimes the way he treats people, there's no doubt about it. His childhood, some drastic things have mm -hmm. had to have happened that he's never dealt with mm -hmm. because the way he tre he's treating people. And don't get me wrong, I think he's, I, I would vote for him again. But the way he treats people, it, mm -hmm. there's something wrong back there that has never been dealt with. And he needs to have the willingness and the courage to go back and deal with that so that he can become better in, in moving forward. And I would say that to any person, like if you find yourself lying or, or these aberrant sin, you're like, why am I doing this? It's likely there's something that's in your life that's an iniquity and an imbalance that he has to like probably through therapy, you go back and you can uncover those things and allow God to deal with you so that you would overcome that issue. Right. right. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Yeah, my heart goes out to Donald Trump because, <laughs> you know, the, it's, it's, there's arrested development somewhere in his childhood, yes. or probably about grade school age, because yes. he re- reverts to that. There's a scar there. There's a wound there that gets triggered. And, you know, when you're a, a billionaire businessman, president of the United States, and you call Hillary Clinton a poo-poo head or whatever, you know, names. <laughs> Just calling names. Yeah, I mean, that that's the playground stuff. And... Um, uh, and so, yeah, so we, we have a, in 3D and living color, um, two significant mental health kind of uh, issues on the presidential front right now. And, and it's, it's painful for, I think I'm, I hurt for America because mm-hmm. if, if, if the, and I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't mean to be critical because I pray, whoever a president is, I pray for. For sure. Mm-hmm. Um, Tough job. So you're not yeah. one of those people that say not my president, huh? No, that's not, <laughs> no, no. Silliness. Uh, no, Biden is my president. He is. And Trump was my president. And he whoever's was. next will be my president. But um, if th- these two guys, with all due respect to them, uh, are the best we have in, for, <laughs> to lead our nation, <laughs> we need to pray for America. We do. Yeah. How did this happen? Huh? How did uh, this happen? Yeah. You know, and, and I know we're segueing right now into politics, which I think we should for just a second. Okay. Um, and I know there's a lot of things to be talked about, especially with, with Jeff and his back in psychology and, and even in ministry, a lot of fun things to talk about. But I think touching on briefly politics in America, um, you know, Jeff, what would you say as far as like, as much as there's some things to be concerned with, which would be our president, our, our, our main candidates, what are some things politically you're optimistic about? I know there's a lot we could say with what's going wrong in America, and I can I can amen most of that. But but on the other side of things, what are the things that we see that are like hopeful or good I, things? I'm most hopeful. I, I, the, the current scene is pretty broken, but here's what I'm hopeful about is that I think Americans are demanding that our political leaders work together yeah. i don't i don't know how they're going to do it doing that yeah. how, but i think the 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 people we the people mm-hmm. are fed up with wrangling and and uh um, stubbornness demonize, demonizing Correct. And, yeah, stubbornness and Correct. all that I, we we just uh, it, enough is enough mm-hmm. and i think when the people uh begin to use their voice and vote uh that's i, I would encourage everyone to get so christians should vote so. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> vote, vote your uh, your conscience and um, issues that are significant to you. Your so, values, yeah, values yeah. For match sure. your values. Absolutely. And so, would you define yourself as maybe a conservative, or where you at on the, the political spectrum? I'm registered independent, but I'm, yeah. I'm more conservative, of course. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, um, having worked for three years with chronically severely mentally ill homeless individuals it did update my view of Mm. you know my my former tendency because i was important and aggravated all that to roll my window down and say well you you know someone had a sign that said we'll work for food i want to roll my window down and say we all do (laughs) but (laughs) it it changed me it softened my heart about that kind of thing so yeah so I, you know, I've, I'm, I'm morphing into a, a, a kinder, gentler conservative, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, I do think there's certainly room to help. I think a lot of times with a lot of the issues that happen, though, is that the church probably is the better answer than the government, and mm-hmm. I think the church could be more empowered right. if. And this is one of my hopes, like some kind of partnership, and I don't know what it looks like. This idea of church and state, the separation of it, which was not a constitutional issue at all, right. but. But somehow, like, the church has a role in helping a lot of the problems. Yeah. They really do. And they can probably more efficiently than the government help to solve those things. But I do, would say it almost takes something of a partnership. Because the level of resources, say, for example, to address homelessness. And I would speak just for the Coachella Valley specifically. Most of the actual work in really helping the homeless is still through Christian groups. Like right. the Coachella Valley Rescue Mission, I think, houses 700 plus a night. Right. The only thing the state has in the, or the county has in the area can house about 20 over in Palm Springs. So, so Christians and the church, in my opinion, still are a huge part of the solution towards some of the major issues we're dealing with right now. But I think sometimes the problem we're having is there's not a cooperation between the two, right? Right. I agree with that completely. Yeah. 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 And the, ch- the church and, and uh, any private endeavor can do it much more cost efficiently than the government. There's just so much red tape and 
too many tiers of for sure hierarchies and managers and all that. so much money gets wasted mm -hmm. and um so i i agree with you on that and um it's even like I would say our church. We do a food bank. I think um, on some Saturdays in the month, we have to pay the, for the food though, and it's a few thousand dollars a month, right? If you know the government, I know they'll give different people money, but they they empowered us more. We would still have volunteers to distribute food freely, right? Yeah. So if they said, "Why don't you have it more often or two times a week?" We could do it with all still volunteers right. Right. at a fraction of their cost, right. and still address some of the, even like the people that have food insecurity or anything like that. But I do think. The government working with the church is probably some of the answer, and I think that we've gotten to a place on both sides where the chasm between, like, I don't know, the church and, and different, uh, like, different opinions have grown so big. We're so divided right now in the United States that it seems like it's hard for people to work together. Mm -hmm, and I right. think really the solution is that the church understands we're the light of this world. I think what happens with the church and a lot of people, we're so intent on getting out of this world because it's so bad, we forgot that Jesus is going to come back and rule and reign with us here. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so no matter which way you view the rapture, you know, pre trib mid trib whatever, or yeah. however you view that, your eschatology, the reality is we come back for a thousand years here. Right. So it is bad here, but that's why he left us here. Right. Is to make a difference. Right. Rather than complain and throw stones and be mad at people, we're here to make a difference and not try to escape this. I mean, I don't, no misunderstanding. Anyway, I look forward to the return of Christ. I, I look forward to it, but understanding that he's coming back here to set up his kingdom here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the, as much as the world's all whatever, it's not all lost. Mm -hmm. There's a big plan that God has for this broken world. Yeah. yeah. I, I think a great opportunity the church has right now that we're missing pretty much completely. Um, and I'm a law and order guy. Mm -hmm. I volunteered 27 years with the sheriff's department as a reserve deputy and, and chaplain. So I'm How many about years? 27. Nice. Yeah. Wow. So I'm about law and order, and I think... The border issue is we, we need to have a border. We, we do. don't have a border right now. Mm -hmm. a at the same time, these people who are, these migrants who are coming in here, uh, they may be here for the rest of their lives, mm -hmm. whether we like it or not. But what an opportunity for the church to reach out and do teach some English classes or some job skills or some. And I think we're sitting back. I uh, That's my sense is that mm -hmm. the the particularly the Protestant church. For sure. Uh, not all Protestants, but many are just aggravated that mm -hmm. well, these guys keep people coming in here. And it and it is frustrating. Lawlessness is frustrating. Yeah. Um, but just like we have chaplains in the prison mm -hmm. uh, for people who have broken the law, I think it's important for the church to step up and maybe be part of the solution. For sure. Rather than just being complainers, mm -hmm. there's no there's no promise in complaining. <laughs> there's no promise. Yeah, there's not. Yeah, you're That's right. Good. I have a question about um, how many years did you work with the homeless? Three, three years. Three yeah. years. So, yeah. so you mentioned something about that. You know that. You know. Well, let, let me ask you this: what What about homelessness? People that are homeless. That did you notice about how they grew up? Uh, in terms of, I would I would venture to guess that most of them had a broken home, oh, yeah, for sure. and or a fatherless home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how important is it for men to step up and 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 play the role of a father? Uh, you know, and how did how did that affect the homeless people that you mentioned that you that you met? I I would agree with you. Um, my job at the county was primarily, did, I did some groups, I did some individual therapy, but I mostly did a psychological assessment. So I would sit with them and do, and, and because mentally ill people are ge generally, not always, but often not very good historians of their own past. Hmm. And they, they have it confused or they can't remember, or depending on the level of, of mental illness, yeah, I have no recollection of it, but I would I would agree with you, and I I I can't cite statistics about what you're asking, but pardon me, fatherlessness bears a big time on mental health, um, and I would yeah just encourage any dad who's listening to really lean in, and I'll also say something about what Pastor Nate, what you said. Um, 
you said your your evaluation was that your wife is a better mom than you are a dad. <laughs> but those are different roles. True. So she may have been doing the mother role really, really well, but I'll bet you were doing the father role really, really well. Because if you're out uh, laughing and horsing around and wrestling with your kids or doing sports or going whatever, yeah, uh, it's a different... And I don't mean to overgeneralize because we're yeah, really, yeah. you know, have to be so sensitive about stuff, but... Father's role is a different role. And for sure. In early childhood development, the rough and tumble play, for instance, is, is so significant to the uh, development of a young child. And moms don't generally, true. Uh, I don't mean to overgeneralize, but generally they're not rolling around on the floor and tickling and sometimes. <laughs> but dads do that, and it's vital. Yeah. It's vital. Moms have different focus and function. And yeah, One of the challenges I'm having right now, so my son Mateo, he's 15 I'm still barely able to beat him at basketball. About nine out of ten times, I can beat him. But it's he's he, his lateral move is so superior that my my record is diminishing. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Pastor. Thank you. <laughs> you know, going back, I did have a statistic. Role. There's a ninety. They say ninety percent of homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. How many? Ninety percent. Wow. So the kids that run away and are homeless, they're Dang. largely coming. Ninety percent, according to this statistic, is from fatherless homes. So that's certainly. I remember seeing uh, something on Respect television. I can't quote the statistics, but they took in prison. They took a little cart around on Mother's Day, so that guy, uh, the guys in prison, could send a Mother's Day card. And almost all the men in prison mm-hmm. took, a, if, certainly if their mother was living, they took yep. a Mother's Day card. When they took on Father's Day, zero. Wow, yeah. zero. I have a statistic here. It says eighty-five percent of youth. 85, I lost it. 85% of youth that are in jail come from fatherless homes. Yeah, yeah I've heard that one before. Heard that one? 85% yeah. of They say 80% of, of, percent of rapists prison. come from fatherless homes too. Wow. So a lot of the aberrant behaviors you're going to see, Dang. don't know all the dynamics. The one study that was fascinating from back in November was how the outcomes for, in a single parent home, the outcomes for the home that had the father Instead of the mother, the outcomes were much better even having the father just as a single parent, right? So you, I would have expected in the study they did from November that a mother would have better outcomes in a single parent role, but they actually said that fathers had a better outcome when it was only just one parent, right? And so I do think the, the vital role that a father plays, even though like, I mean, sometimes emotionally, I'm just like, I can't, especially with daughters, I just, I can't keep up with my daughter. I can't track with all the things that are going on in her biologically I'm just sort of this I don't know whatever but I do think that it's vital fathers are there both for sons yeah. and their daughters yeah. I think we might even be underestimating how important it is to have a father in the yeah. house yeah. yeah I can't even uh I don't think we have even tapped the uh you know the surface of the importance of having a father at yeah. the house what do you think about that I, I agree with that even in the animal kingdom I remember seeing I think it was a national geographic uh, documentary uh, in uh, on the African continent, <clears throat> these elephants, they had killed all the big older bull elephants for the tusks. And so these young male elephants started, um, uh, they would trample down mm. villages and they were just rogue. Mm-hmm. And so they thought about it and thought, and this is, a, a, it's available on uh, you can YouTube and find the mm-hmm. documentary. It was very fascinating because I watched it a couple times since it originally saw it on TV. And they uh, they transported some older bull elephants into the herd, mm. and the testosterone levels of the young young male elephants went down. Their behavior uh, modified in a positive way. Just the presence of an older wow. male elephant calmed the herd. Wow. And and so even in the animal kingdom, it's true. But f- I, I think, uh, uh, Raul, you're exactly right that um, it's a profound impact. But here's the good news. Even So if you're listening and you don't have a dad or don't have a father, God's word promises that he will be the father to the fatherless. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he can make up the difference. But ideally, uh, his God's design is that we have a mom and a dad. And I don't mean to be politically incorrect, and I, with all due respect to every family uh, uh, expression, um, uh, it's just ideal to have a mom and a dad there and loving on 
kids in a healthy way. So let me just, I'll, come, I'll got one more question, then Rob, we can come to the end. But let me ask you this. So knowing what you know now, you're how old? I just turned 65 and I'm on Medicare. Come on. So <laughs> at, at 65, with the wisdom you have now, what are a couple things you would do different if you could go back as far as raising your kids? What would you do differently? So one or two things that you would probably do differently with the wisdom you have now, That's what would you do question. differently as a father? So, Well, first of all, I would uh, prioritize differently. Um, when the kids were young, uh, we were busy. Both, both my wife and I were busy in ministry. We always had live-in nannies because that was the most efficient way to yeah. be able to leave and come home and not have to take the babysitter and all that. Um, but I, I uh, and, and I'll just give you a good ministry example of, of what I'm talking about. Every year for almost 40 years on Christmas Day, our church would uh, provide what we called food friends and fellowship. We did it some years at the Cathedral City Community Center, but many years at the Salvation Army because they, they gave their people the day off. And we would provide a meal and Christmas gifts and sometimes up to 600 people. So that was Christmas. All of my kids' childhood, that was, that was Christmas. So we had a candlelight communion service on Christmas Eve, Christmas dinner on Christmas. So they really never got to have a Christmas Christmas. We, we got them gifts, of course, and we had alternate times. But it, it, I wouldn't do that. I would, wow. I would let somebody else fill in for me every other year or do something. Yeah. And I would reprioritize some of those things. But I was so driven, and we got to do it, and we got to get the newspaper out here and get the media and get the, it's all about all that. Um, and uh, so I would, I would reprioritize. I would... I would uh, when my youngest son was 11, he was hit by a car and almost killed. He had a traumatic brain injury. He was in a coma for a month, both legs broken. We were at Loma Linda Hospital for three months. He was in the hospital. And that helps you kind of mm -hmm. get your bearings a little bit about what's important. And so that was a, a, a painful, helpful moment. Um, so I'd reprioritize, number one. The second thing is I would just slow down. Hmm. Because I was—I don't know what I was in such a hurry about, but to really live and parent and father mindfully, I just took a couple-day training on mindfulness, um, and I love the uh, instructor because he's very practical. And he said, "Mindfulness. Let me just sum up mindfulness because it's a kind of a term, right? You know, it's flavor of the month." Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, "Mindfulness really could be summed up." Pay attention. Hmm. Pay, mindfulness is paying attention. Yeah. Look at that beautiful sunset. Look at that rose. Mm. Look at look at how wonderful my children are. Mm -hmm. and just paying attention. Slow, I would just slow down, slow down, slow down, and enjoy and savor. And even if, because I, I, ultimately Jesus said, "I'll build a church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it." But I, I thought it was pretty incumbent upon me to do most of it for the Lord. <laughs> And, uh, That's you know, so, true. Uh, so, yeah, but I think when we prioritize and, and honor kind of God's design that our, our efforts will be sufficient to accomplish, uh, enough, you know, that yeah. are, are part of the deal. And, um, uh, because I see, I, I know many, many, many preachers who sacrifice their, to some degree, at least, mm -hmm. they sacrifice their family at the altar of performance and yeah. success. Yeah, and uh, and so, business owners and yeah. politicians. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Oh, absolutely. Keep going. Absolutely. Dang. Yeah, there's that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. With that, that uh, slowing down is a big deal, and it's uh, um, when you're uh, into image management, like that was that was my lens. That was that was my perspective on myself. Is I'm an account by what I do. That's how I matter. And um, often ask my clients that why why do you think you matter? And don't answer right now because everybody has a fast uh -huh. answer. But take take a week or two and and really think about what, in your mind, in your world, in your uh, reality, what, what makes you count. Is it how much money you have, or how big your house is, or what, what is it? You know, how how many people in your church? Uh, so it could be all, it could be anything. 
Usually involves the word big, though. Big bank account, big house, big, home, <laughs> big, big house, church, big, big church, big, big, you know, big or muscles. Or fast. Big muscles. Yeah. Fast cars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's my answer. Mm. That's, that's really good. Well, I think we're good. Yeah, we're good. I, I, I truly enjoyed it. I enjoy your wisdom, your insight, and your, your, your comedy. And I thank you for what you've done for the kingdom of God and then as well for you sharing and being honest Thanks, and humble. Pastor, it was Thanks, very sir. kind. Yeah. yeah. So we enjoyed it. We hope to have him back because honestly, yes, there's... let's do it. He can go five levels deeper than where we, we scratched the surface because it's just, honestly, I think he has a, he's a blessing to the kingdom of God. Thanks, sir. Amazing. Honored to be with you guys. Pastor Jeff, I have a question. Where can people find you? Like if people want to know about your church, about your ministry, about what you're doing, where can people find you? Okay, so uh, my email is uh, Dr. Jeff Walker at AOL, Dr. Jeff Walker at AOL.com. You can either the practice or the church, you can just email me and I'll get you the information. The church is in in Palm Desert uh, on Warner Trail, kind of over by that little church, Southwest Community. Uh, <laughs> so I'm hoping we get some overflow from them. So, uh, we're in that general vicinity, though, oh, in Palm cool. Desert. And yeah. my practice is in Palm Desert also at uh, I-10 and Washington. So um, pretty easy access valley-wide. And I am taking new clients if anyone's interested. But mostly I love seeing... Um, not exclusively, but I love seeing Christian men who are in trouble. Um, and almost always it's rooted, you brought it up earlier, it's almost always rooted in early childhood trauma of some yeah. sort. And so, you know, I, I ask the question, and I'm sorry because I know we're kind of tr trying to conclude, but I ask the question, and I'll ask the question to those who are listening. What are you running from and what are you running to? Wow. Because you find someone, they, they show up and they say, I'm running to alcohol, I'm, I'm running to prostitutes, I'm running to... We, we can figure out what That's you're running good. to, mm -hmm. but let's work on what are you running from. Where's mm -hmm. the pain? What's the issue? What's Very What good. needs to be healed? What are the scars? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's the work I love to do. I can carry a lot of hope for guys who don't have much hope. You know, they feel like it's over. I've done too too much, too bad, too, you know, too long. Uh, so I can hold a lot of hope for those people while they build their own hope and it's it's wonderful work excellent thanks for the freebie thanks, that was yeah good. that was really good he's amazing thank you for your time pastor yeah, bless you bless yeah. you so good to be with you guys thanks Oof. god bless